First on our panel here is Dr. Alessio Fasano, who probably needs no introduction at all, but he is the Chief of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition at Mass General Hospital for Children. He is the Director of the Center for Celiac Research, as well as the Director um, of Mucosal Immunology and the Biology Research Center. Thank you. So again, thank you for having me and I put, you know, the 10 slides, 10 minutes, that that's the rule, um, based on the imposition from Emmy, what I need to talk about. So, and again, I put this, uh, you know, also in the perspective, uh, uh, you, know, um, you know, timeline, so that you understand how we got to this, you know, point in which we can even consider clinical trial in pediatrics that was unconceivable until recent past. And first of all, we have been always overlooked when it comes to treatment complementary alternative to gluten-free diet because the general sense is you don't need it. You know, gluten-free is efficacious, works, safe. Why you need anything else? And therefore, all the, the stakeholders that could eventually be supporting this notion, NIH, you know, industry, the Food and Drug Administration, and so on and so forth, have been always, you know, not considered this as an as a priority. Uh, and, and also because, you know, and I remember vividly because I was there, I said, you know, this is not a big deal disease. You know, you don't die like cancer. And I said, with all respect, sir, there are different ways to die. You die faster cancer, and you can die very slowly of silly disease. Which one you want, if you have to choose one? But anyhow, so what are the pros and cons of the gluten-free diet and why we definitely need a clean, a, you know, alternative or complementary, you know, strategies even in pediatrics? Of course, you know, efficacy was indeed believed to be pretty much 100%. That's not the case. You heard many folks before me that that's, you know, not been put in, 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 uh, in question. It is definitely safe. There's no side effects, but you know, socially isolating and difficult. Not impossible, but definitely, um, you know, uh, I believe that it's not a walk in the park. Uh, it, you don't take drugs, so it's not pharmacological. But because of that, the cost, the adjunctant costs of gluten-free diet are not covered, so it's all out of the pocket. You can't negotiate with your health insurance. Of course. You take care of it by yourself. It's self-prescribed. You don't need to go to a healthcare professional to be prescribed the treatment, but that means that the medical support, at least until, until the recent past, has been minimal, to say the least. Um, and of course, there is poor regulation. Uh, it is a treatment. It is the treatment of CD disease, one of a kind in all autoimmune diseases. We don't have a luxury like this for MS or RA or of, of type one diabetes, but literally because we are convinced that this is it, that we don't have alternatives. It's definitely life-saving, but the high burden of treatment is undisputable for who, and we'll hear more, leave this, you know, firsthand. In 2015, there was a change of heart from the Food and Drug Administration that for the first time asked input in these meetings that they call GREAT, uh, this, this acronyms for Gastroenterology Regular Endpoints and Advancing Therapeutics, um, to include also celiac disease, and the goal um, was to discuss the appropriate target population, pharmacological therapy, blah, blah, blah. You can read that. So that was the goal in 2015. Um, why, again, this was accepted? Because finally, people, they realized that, you know, there is a, 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 this has been said already, that not a negligible number of people with celiac disease going on a strict gluten free diet, not cheating, doing this right, they do not respond, either clinically and or histopathologically. Um, and I'm not talking about the refractory that is extremely rare. You know, to give again a number, 1,000 people with celiac disease go on a gluten free diet, 800 will respond to gluten free diet, 200 do not. Of these 200, 190 are non responsive. The ones that inadvertently are exposed to cross-contamination, they are exclusively sensitive to the threshold, the gluten. The other 10, nine of 10 will be type one, and uh, one out of 10 will be type two refractory CD disease. So we are not talking about the rarity, we're talking about a sizable number of people that would not respond. Uh, and, you know, more than 40% of adults, even 
after long years, they have this persistent enteropathy, and we don't know what that means in terms of morbidity and mortality, other than indirect data suggests to have a chronic inflammatory intestine is not a good thing, period, and that's intuitive. I mean, even more scary is that if we have similar situation with the other population. The fact that it is less in terms of percentage doesn't mean that this is less of an issue. Actually, if anything, it's more than an issue because we're talking about the lifespan expectancy that is pretty long in a growing body. This body is still growing in pediatrics. And you see that, you know, again, this is uh, something that was published now a while ago, the age of persistent villal atrophy uh, it, it's, it's really increasing over time. So this is an issue that's not going away. Um, so one of the most challenges, uh, uh, challenging issues uh, is the proper compliance then, because it's, it's, it's the general exception is you, you um, are a master when you um, have control of the gluten-free diet because you cook home and so on and so forth. Then you travel, then you go and sleep work, then you go on vacation, you go to college. Now you're at the mercy of the others to understand the stringency how your gluten-free diet needs to be implemented. And, you know, these are, you know, the, the issues that the adult population face, but the pediatric population face additional issues, uh, you know, that is the ones that is really related to their lifestyle, that, you know, puts them at risk and they don't control, that I mentioned before. Um, and, and this has been overlooked because we said, you know, whatever we do with CD disease in adults, we will struggle it automatically in kids and we are done. That's not a way. It really needs to customize when we talk about indication, inclusion criteria, rational to go for clinical trial in pediatrics. Also, because besides the birthday parties, these kids, they, the school and lunch, and so on and so forth, the CD4, peer pressure. I don't know if you remember, some of you may be more freshly than I do because it was a while ago myself, but your goal is to blend. You don't want to look different. And therefore, and I can go for an anecdotes during discussion, what the peer pressure can do to you in sticking with the program to comply with the gluten free diet. Of course, there is the lack of appreciation long-term consequences. This part of the frontal lobe, it doesn't mature until 17, 18. That's the one that tells you where are the long-term consequences of your behavior today. And, and finally, of course, the, the, the college and so on and so forth. Where we stand now in clinical trials, this was unthinkable in 2015, uh, but you know, we're, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, there are 260 of them, of which the one that are interventional that we really care is 180, so a lot of clinical trials that's going on everywhere in the world, mostly in Europe and the United States, but not exclusively. Um, in the United States, there are a lot of places, particularly East and West Coast, in which we have a very active pipeline of clinical trials. And again, I want to make sure that, am I still on time? You, you don't pay, pay attention, so I, I talk for a long time. I want. Did, that's right, I'm not, but I want to make sure that you are, uh, pay attention to this. So this is a breakdown of where we are in the different phases. And this is extremely important when we talk about you know, trials in pediatrics. There are several that, of course, are early stage, particularly early phase one or phase one. These are the ones that typically will require a gluten challenge. Why? Because we take advantage of the possibility that we can turn it off and on, at will, the inflammatory process. And we can answer specific questions in terms of diagnostic targets and therapeutic targets. Um, so these are the ones that would not be necessary to do anymore. Not in pediatrics, because this work will be done by the time that this clinical trial in the adults will answer those questions, because the mechanisms are the same, the details may be different. So no need, in my humble opinion, to do a gluten, a gluten challenge you know, in pediatrics, if indeed one of these drugs, I'm going to take, take out if, when one of these drugs will hit the market, so final will be approved for you know, adult, use in adults, automatically the FDA will accept clinical trial in pediatrics that will start from phase two. Phase two is the real world. The, you know, the 200 out of 1,000 that will not respond to the strict gluten-free diet despite the good com com compliance. 
and of course the same for phase three. So in my humble opinion, this is the landscape that you were looking at. And now, last slide. This is the last, you know, uh, uh, grade that was grade six. Look how totally they changed their mind. The goal of today's workshop is to discuss the overall approach to drug development in celiac disease that includes an assessment of both clinical symptom and histology. That's repeating what they were doing in 2015. The workshop will focus the discussion on the histological endpoints to assess treatment benefit in patients with celiac disease. That was also an object of discussion in 2015. Regulatory framework for pediatric drug development in celiac disease and the role of gluten challenge in clinical trials to provide a forum for open discussion between stakeholders to facilitate drug development. That was not even in the radar screen of 2015. Bottom line is not if, it's when we will have clinical trials in pediatrics that would better prepare, you know, all the stakeholders, how we're gonna approach this so that we can do this in a safe, appropriate way because, you know, pediatrics by definition is a vulnerable population. And also, again, um, as I was reminded by Emmy, these are not little adults. These are different kind of biology, you know, developmental, you know, uh, challenge and so on and so forth that needs to be taken into consideration when you start to think about designing clinical trial in pediatrics. Mm -hmm.